I, I forget whom this is attributed to, but it's like music is how we decorate time. It's the only artistic uh, thing that's like so time based, I guess. It's the only one. Yeah, I mean, film. There are other. I guess film media. technically. Uh, yeah, but it's, and like I don't know. I mean, they're like when I was growing up in Bloomington, the Dalai Lama's brother lived in Bloomington. So the Dalai Lama and his full retinue would come to Bloomington like every year and a half or something. And so mm -hmm. I got to see a whole bunch of times like Tibetan monks making sand mandalas. And the idea with that is that they'll like show up, they got all their, sh their shit, they'll just work uh -huh. on it tirelessly for two weeks or whatever, however long it takes. And then like at the end they'll finish and they'll be like, okay, cool. And then just destroy it. Destroy it. Yeah. yeah you know, so <laughs> there are some like durational art it's kind of like working on like a 2000 piece puzzle you know during lockdown and then just sure. like, okay i yeah. guess we're done with this now yeah but music <laughs> man music is the way that interacts with people's lives the most i feel yeah it's uh it's the it's the yeah it's the soundtrack to your life yeah you know? that's it well and yeah. you know just in a practical way like as a bass player also you you understand just intrinsically like the 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 power of note duration right like yes the next yes. layer down when you're like really playing bass you're like oh i get it like it's not just the notes it's not just the when it's not how far behind the beat it's also the how long and the spaces are actually the most important you know right. so that's one of those things that is uh, you could again like objectively break it down and like do a kind of like music theory sort of style shankarian analysis and like this person likes to place their note four milliseconds behind the beat on beat one and an average note duration of 138 milliseconds if it's a quarter note and you know what i mean <laughs> but like the incredibly complex stew of all of those things are what makes someone feel like what they are as a player what's the the bass pl uh, i heard him on on cory wong's podcast saying this uh, uh Sean Hurley, he was like, oh, like yeah. A, oh yeah, he, he's like, I really like to hit the bass like right after the kick drum. Sure, like, yeah. There's like a, and it's like I don't know, like you know, teach their own. Like, and then once I noticed that, and I like was listening to him playing, I was like, oh yeah, he's doing that, and I don't know if I dig that, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. And like, but like, he's the one getting called for you know by John Mayer to to go to go gig. So well, and this I think becomes also an interesting tie back into like, what do you do with the bass, right? Like, for example doing that in a recording setting means that you can assign mm -hmm. more low-end power to both elements in the mix if their right. timing's a little staggered. Exactly. Yeah, like a, like a side chain. Yeah, it's, it's like automatically, right? And that like leads into the larger sort of conversation about like all mixing actually starts from orchestration. So uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine yesterday about he's trying to get me to mix a record for him and I'm just kind of slammed right now. And he was like, oh, all the songs are the same. It's like the same band, blah, blah, blah. I was like, it doesn't matter because they're different songs or different tempi. They're different key centers, you know? So like, even though the sort of timbres are the same, like put those instruments playing different notes and different keys and like the way they add up into a two track is going to have to be revised fundamentally wow. no matter what. You know what I mean? Yeah, play yeah, a whole yeah. song in D and then play a whole song in C with the same instruments and see what happens to the way you mix that song. You're going to be dealing with very different resonances. Yes, right. Like boosting 60 on the kick all of a sudden maybe doesn't work as well as 50. Exactly. Right? And those whatever. things won't track linearly either. Like you can't be like A440 and then now it's A... Yeah, we're moving all of our cues over. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't track linearly like that either. So Right. This right, is right, right. Everything or the is, compressor might hit harder, you know, in C than it does in D, or for you know, because of whatever note is resonating. Totally. So, so does it take you a long time to mix? Like you're, it sounds like you're quite detail granular. No, no, it's fast. It's fast. Uh, all this stuff, you know, I like I'm, I'm we're working backwards from you know I'm intellectualizing an ersatz process as we're talking about this here, right? Like, uh -huh. I don't sit here in in any way with that as a sort of monologic parallel to my work process. I'm not like, well, it's time to make an EQ, it's time to do the thing. I'm just like reacting, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So no, and you know, just for example, with again with like the sort of film and TV stuff, like there's just no, it's got to be now 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 so i think you know uh i did the score mix for that netflix show inventing anna that's kind of blowing yeah, up everywhere I saw right that. now i mean i didn't see the show but i saw that you did the work and i listened to like the opening track oh yeah which cool. sounded which sounded great oh thanks yeah I, I think i did some programming on that that title as well um but like the mix turnarounds for that something like that is like immediate right like because production is so busy and because they were also contemporaneously working on Bridgerton, they just had a stage 24 hours a day. 
So they were just like changing the schedule kind of constantly and like music reviews were happening kind of sporadically and like we would just get approval and then have to record and then have to mix and turn over just kind of like as soon as, you know. Wow. Uh, And durationally there's probably like 20 to 30 minutes worth of music in every episode. So that's like ingestion, interpretation, well, ingestion, setup, interpretation, well, (laughs) ingestion, setup, problem solving, interpretation, output, you know, so those five things have to happen. And I, you know, I was like, I bill hourly for that kind of work generally. So I have this plugin that's just a timekeeper that's baked into the template and like, you know, it was getting to the point where if I was having to iterate on revisions on something, like I would be mixing a piece of music that was like, you know, 90 seconds long in like 23 minutes, including all of those steps, you know? Wow. That's and that's, great. that's not like with a template either. Like I'm not a template mixer at all. Like the only yeah, part I, I was, I was assuming you weren't. <laughs> not even a little bit, bro. Yeah. The only thing that I have yeah. figured into a template is the, is the output routing. So that I can just mm-hmm. kind of easily get type. your stems. Yeah, exactly. So, so why, why, how are you able to do it all so fast? It's just, it's just instinct. It's just like react, bam, 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 done. Yeah, well, you know, you don't that overthink kind of it. Stuff like it's not. There's not a lot of interpretive. Like I think of, I think of mixing broadly in sort of two categories, right? Like there's the right. creative and corrective. Mm-hmm. In terms yeah. of the steps that you're taking to in order to achieve the result that you're looking for, like you, you have all these wonderful creative things that are the places where people like record a dictaphone in their duck suit in the garage with the water running and a blank intention track and all those fun things, you know. But then there's the corrective where you have to like deal with non harmonic resonances and do all the kind of unglamorous things that make a good mix translate into other environments, right? Mm-hmm. And like it's always the tightrope walk is like the the fucked up quality of something is also what makes it special and also what makes it difficult to replicate right so like the tyro block is kind of capturing these interesting magical sounds and then also understanding how well and how far you can push like some of these shitty samsung television or iphone before that just starts being a crappy resonance you know so creative and corrective are kind of the, the the classes that I think of broadly mixing in, in terms of, and, um, you know, by the time in a TV show where it's it approvals from everybody, like, it's not the time to be like, what if, what if I put a echoplex on this whole thing, you know, like, fuck you kid, like get the fuck out of here, mix it. You know what I mean? So I'm yeah. really just doing like corrective optimizations. I'm mixing for an RMS, I'm like doing MS. I'm doing, I, I do a lot of, um, mid cuts, like in terms of mid band, not, not mm-hmm. frequency band, like mid side, mid band. Like I'll do yeah. a lot of mid only stereo EQ, uh, in order to deal with like, um, just making room for dialogues basically. Right. Which yeah. is a really useful thing that I have now extrapolated back into my music work, like music, uh-huh. non, non, uh, Synced music non-film board. yeah exactly of like carving out space for the vocals and exactly and then just kind of thinking about the the spectrum more broadly in terms of how you can affect different parts of it to make space like i think of a good mix mm. is like you remember in like super nintendo games where you're like running to the right like how they would achieve the the impact of distance is a technique called parallax and I sort of think about like it's like two objects in the distance moving at different rates implies the the fact of something being changing in a, in a perspective, right? Uh-huh. Like okay. It, it implies distance for the farther object if it moves more slowly than objects closer in the foreground. Right. Okay. You know? Okay. Yeah. And then sure. the way they achieve that effect is like space in the objects in the foreground left over that objects in the background could take over, right? So I think of mixing as, as like that. You, you, you make these spaces interlocking, kind of carve out interlocking spaces for the elements of something timbrely floor to ceiling. And then mm-hmm. also front to back. With like the reverbs and like, uh, or just like balance. 
Well, specifically in the, in the context of what we were talking about with, with tiny EQ cuts and also mm. specifically with like EQ cuts that are not just broadband across the stereo spectrum, but like mid only EQ cuts or boosts on the side, you know, like really thinking about the whole stereo perspective as, as something that can be manipulable on the instrument bus and insert level as well, you know? Wow. So you're thinking of mid range EQ as something that could make something seem further apart by like cutting out that girth i guess that's, that's so right speak. yeah exactly have you ever studied psychoacoustics at all that's pretty fascinating way into this stuff too. I, I've, like, not not really <laughs> but i i was just talking about like psychoacoustics of the you know of uh you know the Poltec eq and like sure what the cuts actually doing versus sure. like the i was uh, on a recent episode of my podcast and and now this the, the guest is going to do like an addendum because he kind of figured out he messed up his uh like exactly how it works and got it. putting <laughs> he wants you know, to come you, back and set the records right yeah like okay this is what i did experimenting exactly yeah but it, it's so it's so it's so interesting I, and i had a guest of the show named nicholas de lorenzo he's a mastering engineer in australia and he he had like a tiktok reel that said like you know if you if you play a thousand hertz and 1200 hertz at the same time like just like resonant frequencies you'll hear 200 hertz yep. and like holy that's like, called holy shit, like how yeah. It's crazy. Heterodyning. Like, you have to put the other one out of phase, though, right? Um, no, you didn't have to put it out of. I didn't have to put it out of phase. You oh, hear it just underneath it. You know, oh, so right, all of a sudden, oh, like right. that kind of like mm, comes yeah. out. All of a yeah, sudden, yeah. that 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 is called heterodyning. That that effect. Um, uh -huh. And it's a. It's like you said. It's the combinatory effect of those things create a frequency modulation sideband that is perceived as lower. That's the same reason that the Nyquist filter exists is because uh, above the sampling period for a digital f system, like it'll start to fold back lower right. frequencies. And, cause you're talking about like, like getting to like 44.1 or 48 or whatever. Yeah. So like you ever seen a car where rims start and the rims start to look like they're going backwards for a second? Yes. Yes. So yeah, that's yeah. what, that's the reason that the Nyquist filter exists is because if something is playing back in a digital system that doesn't have that filter it will start to reinterpret frequencies that are higher than it can understand as lower frequencies oh yeah no shit yeah that because, makes a lot of sense yeah because they you know the, the full period of the waveform can't be represented in the sampling period of the digital waveform you know what i'm saying uh-huh you need to have like a full sine wave inside of the sampling period of the thing in order to correctly recreate that frequency I, I need to think about this. <laughs> think about it this way. If think yeah. about a sine wave, right? Yeah. Think about the uh -huh. box a sine wave goes in. Mm -hmm. If if it was longer than that box or shorter right. than that if if it's longer than the box, you just make more boxes. But if it's shorter than that box, you can't draw it inside of one box. You need a smaller box. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like if it goes whoop 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 you're looking at one box still it starts here and then the box is just going to be like oh it's ending here so i guess it's a frequency of this of this frequency value or whatever it's this hertz even mm -hmm. though the period is going inside of that one box faster than that box understands got it do you know what i'm saying i think so <laughs> sorry i'm it's kind of an obtuse no, explanation no no, no I, I i need to think about it I'm going to get this when I re-listen to this again. Yeah, but <laughs> I, heterodyning is, a, is an interesting thing, and it's something that you'll notice organically happening a lot if you're working with a background singer who's very talented and mm -hmm. you have them stack vocals a lot. Sometimes, yeah. I don't know if you've ever been working on a, a chorus or something and like a pitch will jump out out of nowhere, and if you start soloing tracks, it's not actually recorded in any of those tracks. Yes, it yeah, only this happens to me. when yeah. it's the combinatory effect of those three tracks. Those things, those frequencies, those complex timbres adding together create a sideband which occurs below the perceived frequency often, and when it occurs below, it's called heterodyning. Yeah. That is crazy. That's yeah, the whole that's premise that frequency modulation synthesis is based around too when you add two waveforms together or, or by extension also sort of FM and AM radio or like carrier wave and, and oscillator wave like that same kind of premise. Man, psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics is great, man. And, and you know, it's so so important to understand how the shit works because we're trying this is what we both use and are trying to trick, right? So like, uh, I don't know, the head-related transfer function or acoustic shadowing or uh, intelligibility band, like these are actually really important 
biological effects that are also super helpful to understand as a mixer. Like the human intelligibility band, right? Like you've ever heard a baby cry. You know what the fuck that is right. instinctually. You know? We're talking about like the 2K region, right? Yeah, it's like 700 to 2K or whatever. Mm, so for okay, example, yeah. a, a trick that I do all the time that takes advantage of the human intelligibility band trick is like say you've got a really dense mix and there's a lot of saturation already in it and you don't know what to do and there's something that the artist is like, oh, I need the background 17 to be so much louder. So what you can do is you can instantiate a decapitator or whatever your favorite 